full of contradictions. So later on, she denies the fact that there is such race, which again is the kind of kind of stuff that the left does all the time. They 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 take the moral high ground. Oh, there's no such thing as race, but there is such. But I'm white, and you're black, and you're green, and you're you, you know whatever, right? So they take something that they believe doesn't exist, and then they attribute to it massive significance. They are so dishonest in that sense. So creepily dishonest in that sense. And then she says, it took me a long time to figure out that this is important. And it's uncomfortable. Because race is something we attribute to them. But we treat ourselves as individuals. Now, there's a certain truth to that. There's a certain group, um, uh, among Americans, there's a certain group, call them white racists, who think of themselves as individuals, and many of them fly the banner of, 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 uh, of capitalism and individual rights, but they consider anybody who looks differently from them as inferior. So they view race as belonging to somebody else. And of course, in, in more recent times, what's happened is that group is now self-identified with their own race, which is white. And I don't see much difference between her, who is going to be apologetic about the fact that she's white, and the white supremacist. The fundamental difference, between, the fundamental sameness between all of them is the importance they place on the color of their skin, is the importance they place on so-called race, the importance they place on the group to which they belong, the fact that they do not, cannot, will not identify as individuals and not only identify themselves as individuals, but identify others as individuals. So what all this is, is collectivism on steroids. And everything, the whole frame of mind, the whole way she thinks about these issues, you'll notice, is purely collectivist. There is no individual. There is no individual mind. There are no individual choices. All there is is the group, the group you belong to, and the other group, the group you do not belong to. Now, the modern view of race, racism is that only the dominant view, only, sorry, only the dominant race, and I put race in quotes because I don't believe there is such a thing, can be racist. That the oppressed group cannot be racist. But that is a perversion of the concept. The concept of racism applies to anybody, oppressed or oppressed soul, who treats people, views people as member of a race rather than as individuals. That's what racism means. And it goes in all directions. All right. So notice this. She's white. She's, in a sense, it's important to her she's white. And there's some baggage that comes with being white, which she's going to get into. I was just a white bread, a Heinz 57. Uh, I didn't have race. I was socialized to see race as individual acts of discrimination and prejudice which is actually what racism is. But notice, too, there's no free will in her story. And, and, and she's not a... What she does is combine two aspects of determinism. She is a gene determinist. That's her racism. That's her whiteness, although she rejects that later. More importantly, she is a social determinist. She constantly talks about, I was socialized too. I was socialized too. Every idea she had in her head, she was socialized too. Nothing was her conclusion. Everything was how she was socialized. And she attributes that to all of us. You will see. All of us have been socialized too. View the world in a particular way. View race in a particular way. And for example, one of the things we socialize too God forbid, is the view of colorblindness, the view that color doesn't matter. We were socialized to 
view ourselves as individuals and not member of this collective. That's not a positive in her mind. That is a negative, that we were socialized to that. Individual acts that anybody could do to anybody else. And if you did those acts, you were a bad person. All that is true. What's wrong with that? And that is why, since I saw myself as a good person, I didn't see myself as connected to racism uh, and certainly didn't see myself as connected to race. In other words, I didn't have a sense of a racial identity. Today, I And that's good, by the way. That's, that's the way you should have stayed. But she, she's got a doctor in front of her name, so I assume she got a PhD. My guess is that's where she got corrupted while going to school, while being socialized into academia. That's where these bogus notions of race were implanted. She adopted them, right? By choice. She has free will. Stand that I move through the world always and most particularly as a white person. I have a white frame of reference and I have a white experience. So you move through the world as a white person with a white frame of reference and white experience. And to try to turn her volume down, tell me if that worked. And tell me if it's too much. Um, wow. Right. Again, she experiences the world, not as an individual, but as a white person. What does that mean? Does she experience the world the same as I do? Because I happen to have the same skin color? And let's abstract away the fact that I'm genetically, supposedly, whatever it means, Jewish, I don't know if that differentiates us or not. Um, D'Angelo, she's not Jewish. So she experiences the world. Weird. And part of being white is to have that be invisible to us and to be able to live our lives without ever acknowledging that, to see that as non-operative. I now understand racism as a system, as a deeply embedded system, a system that our country was founded on and that all our institutions were created out of. Now notice, this is a gimmick, a trick that they play on us. <sighs> Moral judgment can only be placed fundamentally on an individual. You can place moral judgment on a system, the system of slavery, is immoral. But fundamentally, the actions taken by individuals are moral or immoral. And the system is a system created by individuals. And the system is a system upheld by individuals. And a system, in a sense, is the cumulative actions of individuals. You can't have a racist system if individuals are not racist. For example. Notice also she, she believes the country was founded on a system of racism. Ignore 90% of what America represents. Ignore the Declaration of Independence. Ignore what was written down. The fact of slavery is the dominant fact. It's the only fact that's relevant for these people. It makes nothing else matters. The fact that the Declaration of Independence indeed lays the foundation for the elimination of slavery, the elimination of racism in the end, it under, underpinning the Declaration is the morality of individualism which rejects racism. Ignore all that. That we created a government of uh, a government of, of 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 checks and balances and and that protects individual rights. Again, the Constitution, which lays the foundation for the elimination of slavery and ultimately the elimination of all racism, institutionalized racism. All of that is ignored. Basically, she takes, and I'm sure she's been involved in this in the New York Times 1619 project, which basically says. The defining characteristic of America, indeed the only thing that really matters about America, is racism. America was established to protect racism, to protect slavery. The Declaration and Constitution are just 
pretenses at some kind of universal rights of man. They didn't care. They didn't matter. What mattered was that the, 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 the founding preserved slavery. That even when we fought a civil war to eliminate slavery, we maintained Jim Crow. And even when we got rid of G Jim Crow, we continue to have institutionalized racism. And indeed, the argument is that by being white, we have no choice, even if we are immigrants to this country, we have no choice by being part, but to be part of a system of institutionalized racism against black Americans. I mean, it is such a perversion of history. First, slavery has been a part of the human race forever. It's in the Old Testament. Jews have slaves. Jews are slaves in Egypt, right? And then Jews have slaves. Everybody has slaves. The Romans had slaves. The Greeks had slaves. Now, I'm not justifying slavery. I'm just saying it's been a feature of human existence forever. And then, in a miraculous period of some, I don't know, 60, 70 years, slavery basically is outlawed, is deemed morally reprehensible, and is banned from human society. And it all happens. It all happens within a few decades of the writing of the Declaration of Independence, inspired by, and you can see it in all of the people who fought for getting rid of slavery, whether here or in England and other places, inspired by the idea of all men are created equal in the Declaration, inspired by the idea of individual rights and alienable individual rights, which we all have because we're human. I mean, it's, it's to not see the causal relationship between the founding of the United States of America and the elimination of slavery. Now, this is not to excuse the fact that there was slavery in America. This is not to excuse the founding fathers who had slaves. They should be morally condemned for that. But at the same time, not to see that it was them, their words, their ideas, their philosophies, their teachings, their writings, that made the elimination of slavery ultimately possible in England, which not just banned slavery for themselves, but banned the slave trade. And then ultimately in the United States, by Lincoln and through a civil war, is just not to understand history. It's not to understand anything about human beings. It's to view everything through one prism, a racist prism. I mean, the real ugly truth is that the defenders of racism today, the, the people who propagate racism today, are leftist intellectuals in our universities. They are the equivalent of the intellectuals of the South who defended slavery at the time. So today they're not defending slavery, but they are defending racism. Now, this is not to deny that white racism against blacks has been around for, forever in this country. It's not to deny the evil of slavery. It's not to deny the evil of Jim Crow. It's not to deny the evil of individual acts of racism. And it's certainly not to deny the systemic racism that existed before the civil rights, before the 1960s, where in the law you had racist policies. But you don't justify laws that discriminate against somebody who would happen to have a white skin. You don't justify that. History does not justify racism. 
You don't fix an evil by creating an evil. The fact that you're poor, you're suffering, that you're being discriminated against, that you're at a disadvantage, does not, does not justify your racism. Ayn Rand wrote in, um, in, her, in, the, in an essay called The Age of Envy, in The Return of the Primitive, she wrote, today racism is regarded as a crime if practiced by a majority, but as an inalienable right if practiced by a minority. The notion that one's culture is superior to all others solely because it represents the traditions of one's ancestors is regarded as a chauvinism if claimed by a majority but as ethnic pride if claimed by a minority. So Ayn Rand rejects racism in every direction, by any individual or group. But what the left today does is it places virtue, morality, identity in one's race. And in doing so, it is the most racist movement today in America, and I think much of the white racism that exists today, and I think it's rising, and I think it's increasing, and I think it's becoming very, very dangerous. Some of it has always been in America, and some of it now has become a response to the intellectuals of the left. A response to the identity politics that's reflected by people like Robin D'Angelo. Okay, let's keep listening. And every institution reinforces the system. Every institution reinforces the system. Like what? What institutions? Like, give us an example. Like, how do universities reinforce the system given, given affirmative action? Given what is being taught in the humanities? Doesn't this institution indeed reinforce your point of view? Is it your point of view now dominant at the universities? Then why is the system still in existence if you are running the system? Does it exist in every workplace in America? It, it, these broad generalizations, without examples, I'm not going to let her talk. I'm going to comment on what she says. You can all go listen to her video and watch the whole thing straight and enjoy it. I'm here to comment on her stuff, and I'm going to expect to comment five minutes on every minute she, she has because, you know, she's got the floor, and this is my one opportunity to go at her. If you ever want to organize a debate between me and her, love to do it. And it's a system of unequal power. So let me give you an example. Women in the United States got the right to vote in 1920. And there was only one possible way that we could have gotten the right to vote, and that was for men to give it to us, because we literally were not sitting in the seats of institutional power. We could not give ourselves the right to vote. That doesn't mean that we couldn't have personal power, but we didn't have institutional power. And that's the difference between a system and individual acts. So what does that even mean? So it's true. The woman cannot get the right to vote until men who had the right to vote could vote for them to have the right to vote. And that's, again, a tragedy of the Declaration of Independence and of the starting of the country that women didn't have the right to vote. But again, there's a history there. Women have not had a right to vote anywhere, and America was one of the first countries to allow women to vote and give them right to property, and, 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 and not give them the right to property, recognize their right to property, and recognize the fact that they are equal to men from a rights perspective. That was an achievement. And the system was geared against women before that. Okay. What is the equivalent of that? Clearly, slavery was systemic racism. Clearly, Jim Crow laws were systemic racism. Clearly, laws that didn't allow women to vote were systemic. Now what? Now what? Prior to women's suffrage, I could certainly discriminate against men, I could be unfair to individual men, but 
my group could not systematically deny men as a group the right to vote. And men controlled all the institutions and they all worked together to don't. convey the message that women's place was here and men's place was there. And then it and changed. that's the difference between individual prejudice and a system of inequality. Note how she switches here. And, and she does this all the time. And we'll see if I can catch her every time she does it. A system of prejudice and a system of inequality. What kind of inequality? They never define their terms. They never define their terms. Inequality, what kind of inequality? Economic inequality? Or political inequality? Political inequality is bad. It, it, political inequality is usually a reflection of racism or prejudice. But is that what she's talking about? Or something else? Also note that yes, men could stop women from having the vote, but how did that change? It changed because individual men changed their minds. Individual women fought for it. Individual women got together in organizations and lobbied and fought and argued and debated and wrote and spoke and convinced men, some men, not all men, to change their minds. And they did change their minds because individuals have free will. Individuals can think of themselves. Individuals can change their minds. It wasn't the group suddenly got the revelation that women should have the vote. It was hard fought. And lots of individual minds needed to be changed. But in her universe, the individual doesn't exist. It's just groups. It's just gangs. It's just tribes. Men, black, white, women, black, white, and of course, there are all kinds of relationships of power between them, which is the whole intersectionality story, which I've done shows on in the past and probably will have to do shows on in the future because it doesn't look like it's going away. So in this field, we think about oppression, or in this case, racism, as group prejudice backed by institutional power. Group prejudice backed by institutional power. That's what racism is. No, that's not what racism is. But that is a manifestation, can be a manifestation of racism. The question is, what is a group? Who is the group? I assume whites. And what is the institutional power they have? Where does that institutional power manifest itself? So we'll see the example she uses. And so prior to the civil rights movement, it was fairly socially acceptable for white people to just come out and say, we are superior. My father certainly was comfortable saying that. The great joke of Archie Bunker and all of the family was that he wasn't up with the times and he was still saying um, things that conveyed this idea. But post-civil rights, it became bad to be racist, right? It became unacceptable to be racist. Isn't that a good thing? You think that would be something to be celebrated? And that seems like a positive thing, right? Racism is bad. But unfortunately, what it morphed into is to make it impossible for white people to look at racism because what we hear is, I would have to be a bad person in order to perpetuate racism. It became a moral issue. Isn't it a moral issue? Isn't racism a moral issue? Isn't to be a racist and to perpetuate racism and to be involved in the perpetuation of racism a bad thing? But she's going to say no. She's going to say you're, you're part of a racist system even though you individually are not racist and you have to recognize that and it, so it doesn't put moral blame on you as an individual. It puts moral blame on the system while freeing the individuals from moral blame, which is very dangerous. You're not at fault. It's just a system that is at fault. In addition to years of reflection and study of my own racial identity. And she needed years of reflection and study to figure out her own racial identity. I mean, it's, it's truly spooky language. Really spooky, racist language.
shapes my life and my experience and my perspectives. I've had the very rare opportunity to, for a living, day in and day out, lead primarily white groups of people in discussions of race and racism. And there are some very, very predictable patterns that come up in these conversations. And as I listen to these, it's almost like a script, right? That like, it's almost as if as white folks, we're, we just pick up this script and we say the same things again and again. As white folks, us white folks, we're all, we're all the same. We all say the same stuff. We have the same script because we've been socialized in the same way. And as a sociologist, rather than seeing something that's patterned as meaning therefore it's true, I look at something patterned as, as very revealing of how we get socialized we to get see socialized things and again. to see the world. And then the next question that follows that is, and so how does that function? Right? And when we look around us, we can see that although we have changes since the civil rights movement and we have this idea of racism being bad, we still have the same unequal outcomes by race. So now it's unequal outcomes by race. Now it's not equality before the law. Now it's not discrimination. It's not legal discrimination. It's unequal outcomes by race. Now, you know, the whole idea of equality of outcome is a very dangerous, very, very dangerous idea. Now, there is a good question of if you see whole groups that are fundamentally different and the outcome is fundamentally different, then it's legitimate to ask the question of what's going on, right? But it's not it's not clear, right? So while it's true that blacks as a group do worse economically than whites, and there's certain historical reasons for that that have to do with accumulation of wealth over generations that they didn't get an opportunity to do because of institutionalized racism before the civil rights, it's also true that some blacks are very successful, extra very successful in academia, in business, in every, in every aspect, lawyers, doctors, in everything, right? They're just as successful as anybody else. But again, individuals don't matter. What matters is these group things. And the only explanation that is possible for this inequality is racism. But not the racism of you discriminating against somebody. Institutional racism. The system is racism. The system somehow is holding them down. And I did a whole thing on systemic racism. You can find that in my, in my videos from about a week ago, two weeks ago. Every measure we have racial inequality. So how do we have such different narratives than we had prior to the civil rights movement and still have unequal outcomes? Because it would be bizarre if you had equal outcomes, particularly given the, the, the unequal history. Even if you had complete laissez-faire capitalism, which we don't, of course. Um, even if you didn't have all the things holding back the black community, like welfare, like minimum wage, like licensing laws, like the war on drugs, like everything else, you still wouldn't have equality. And equality doesn't matter. What matters is uh, individuals have maximizing their opportunities. And then it's a question of whether they take advantage of those opportunities. And that also has to be asked. Are people taking advantage of their opportunities? Do they live in a culture which encourages taking opportunities and succeeding? And as I listen to white folks, my group, um, repeat these narratives over and over, I got this image of a dock, like a pier, and it's just floating on the water, and that's all the superficial things that we say. And you probably What's recognize the some of these, you hear them, maybe you've said them yourself. These are superficial. I don't see color. I was taught to treat everybody the same. I don't care if you're pink, blue, purple, polka dotted. My parents weren't racist, that's why I'm not racist. Or my parents were racist, that's why I'm not racist. It doesn't really matter what goes in front of it. How are those superficial? I don't see race, I don't care about race, all that, which is what all of those represent. That is deep. That's a huge achievement. But that to her is unreal because it doesn't conform with her priors. The prior is, the prior that shapes her thinking is, 
There's racism everywhere. The inequality that we see around us is a consequence of racism. There is no other explanation for it. Therefore, everything people are saying is meaningless. It's just a disguise. It's not real. The answer is always, I'm not racist. I know people of color. I used to work uh, in the military. All of the things we say to rationalize um, that we ourselves are not complicit in this system. Now, I want to speak to two of these before I kind of take us below the surface of the dock. And one is this idea that our parents taught us to treat everyone the same. And I am just going to put it out there like this. No, they didn't. That is not humanly possible. Human beings are not objective. You cannot be taught to treat or to see everyone the same. And when you say that, you're indicating that you don't understand how socialization works, which is actually a positive thing in the sense that that can direct what you would need to focus on if you want to get deeper understanding. <laughs> the other one I want to speak to is this common trope of, I don't care if you're pink, purple, polka dotted. If that's in your vocabulary, I would urge you to please drop it and never say it Why? again. Although it isn't intentional, it's actually very demeaning. People don't come in those colors, and what it conveys is that you're not prepared to engage with authenticity. In other words, you're not willing to engage in the fact that you are racist. You're not willing to engage in the fact that you are inherently racist, no matter what you actually do. And that's why I have this image of a dock, right? That's very superficial surface. And for me, in trying to understand how all this works, what it means to be white um, and live so separate by race, even though I have, was taught to see myself individually as open-minded and outside of all. She says her parents were pretty good, although she said her father was a racist, so that's kind of interesting. Her father was a racist, but she was taught to be open-minded, to view herself as an individual, and not view other people based on their race. What happened to you? You, you? Sounds like you got a decent education. I think what happened to her is she got a PhD. I've had to go under the surface, and that's why I have this image here now of under the water, you see the pier, the pillars or posts that prop up the surface. Okay, so. For example, it's very common in, in discussions of race to have white people tell you about all the people of color in their lives, right? Oh, I have these coworkers, or my best friend, or my second cousin married a black man, or all of the ways that we want everyone to know that we have relationships with people of color, okay? And so we're giving you evidence, right? When someone gives you, tells you that, they're giving you evidence. And so what are they giving you evidence of? They're giving you evidence that because they love people of color, know and love people of color, they can't be racist, which means they see racism as conscious dislike. Or <laughs> What else is it? It's conscious dislike. It's conscious discrimination. That's what racism is. So if you have friends, if you have loved ones who are of a different race, you're probably not a racist. But that, again, doesn't fit her priors. Explicit bias or hatred, right? And they're, they're communicating to you that they don't have conscious dislike That's or right. hatred, as evidenced by all of these people in their lives. And what we don't understand is the power of implicit bias. Most bias is unconscious. Most bias is unconscious. Because we're not in control of our own lives. We're not in control of the decisions that we make. Now, let's say that is true. Let's say there is significant unconscious bias. But when you make a decision, you make it consciously. See, you can ignore the unconscious bias. Now, maybe when you're making very quick decisions, you can't. But most important decisions we make in life are not quick decisions. They're thoughtful. We weigh the evidence. We look at facts. We use reason. And when we allow, when we notice racist ideas coming into our thinking, we can easily suppress those, reject them as irrational, and move on. So even if you have unconscious biases, you are not a racist. Even if you have unconscious biases, if you don't act on them 
If you don't allow them to corrupt your thinking, your actions, then you are not a racist. But again, in, to some extent, for her, everything about us is unconscious because we are deterministic beings. We're determined by our environment, by our socialization. We're determined by our implicit biases. And you see, you can't win with these people because even if you act 100% non-racist, even if you have, act every single day of your life as a good, rational human being, even if consciously you reject the idea of race as irrational and silly, silly, as a man-made mechanism to feel superior to others. That's why racism, the whole idea of race came into existence. You're still not a good person. You're still not, well, you're still not free of racism because you've got those implicit biases. And those, you know what, you can't really get rid of those. So you're always going to be a racist. And that makes it very, very dangerous because it drives our behaviors, but we're not aware of it. So you're not aware of the behaviors. You're not aware of what drives your behaviors. You're not a thinking being. You're not a reasoning being. You're not a choosing being. You're just a being that is driven by a subconscious. Yes, it's wonderful to have people of color in your life if you're white. Many, many, many people, white people, don't have people of color. In that is so disgusting. Yes, it's wonderful that you have people of non-color in your life. Who the hell does she think she is? It's so pretentious and aloof and superior. It's relationships but that doesn't mean your life is free of racism that doesn't mean you don't have a white experience or a white perspective no but you're the one who says you have a white experience and a white perspective you are the racist now she's going to admit to being a racist in a minute so uh, it's not going to become a shock to her but she is the racist and it also what we need today what i call the new intellectual would be any man or woman who is willing to think meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourrunbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, yourrunbookshow. And, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...